Hello, this is Dr. Armand again, bringing you another exciting lab lecture for the General Chemistry One Lab Lab Series. Uh, today we'll be looking at Lab Ten, which is the uh, spectrophotometric analysis of copper two plus. Unfortunately, this is a bittersweet time because this is the last lab lecture, meaning this is the last lab. Yay! We made it through ten labs. So this is it. This is the last one. After this is the final exam. So you won't be having any more lab lecture shows from Dr. Armand. So in this lab lecture, we're going to be talking about a copper 2 plus, why it forms a colored solution when you put it in water. For example, it's blue. With other anions, it has different uh, colors. We're going to be looking at why do transition metals give us nice colored solutions, whereas those that are the main group elements do not. And that's going to be the main focus of today's lab lecture. Now, this lab lecture is going to kind of follow the previous lab lecture because we'll also be doing Beer's Law plots in this lab lecture, or in this lab, excuse me. And so we'll be looking at some of the similar things, doing serial dilutions, calculating new concentrations of solution, of dilute solutions from concentrated solutions, etc. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the last show. So again, as I said before, we'll be looking at the spectrophotometric determination of copper 2 plus in solution. Now, copper, like many transition metals, form colored solutions when you put them in water. So for example, let's say you dissolve copper 2 nitrate in water. What happens is that copper coordinates with water. So water here is referred to as a ligand, and a ligand contains at least one accessible lone pair of electrons. And so that's what we mean by ligand. It contains at least, it's a compound that contains at least one accessible lone pair of electrons where the metal can interact with that lone pair. So of course with water, as we know from general chemistry, water has two lone pairs. So we draw the water molecule. So this is the, the you know, the simplistic rendition of the Lewis structure of water. So these two electrons here, and here can interact with a metal and they form what's called a coordination bond. And this results in a complex ion, which is copper surrounded by six waters, but notice there's no change in the charge, it's still two plus. Now, typically when you dissolve, or I should say, usually when you dissolve transition metals in water, they typically like to have six water molecules around a transition metal cation. So usually, six water molecules will coordinate around a transition metal cation. And six is a usually a good number when you're talking about waters, because typically, uh, when copper has six ligands or six coordination bonds around it, it forms what's called octahedral geometry. So if you're taking the lecture, 1103, you'll learn about the geometries and octahedral geometry is a type of molecular geometry. And so when you put copper and it's only surrounded by waters, we get a light blue solution. However, as we'll see later on in this lecture, when you replace the waters with a chloride as a ligand, you get a green solution. So by changing the type of ligand that's interacting with the transition metal cation, you can get different colors of solution. Likewise, iron three plus, when you put it in water, coordinates six water molecules around it, which is also octahedral geometry. 
and it gives an orange color solution. Now, the reason that these water molecule formulas are written a little bit unusual is because the oxygen is what coordinates to the iron, not the uh, hydrogen. So that's why I write it as OH2 on the right side instead of H2O. Secondly, these wedges mean that the two back water molecules are going into the plane of the paper, or screen, I should say. And the two front water molecules are coming out of the screen. So it's like a three-dimensional representation of the geometry. So again, just to recap before we get started, ligands are compounds that can are compounds or can be an ion. They can be either or they can be compounds or ions that have at least one lone pair of accessible electrons for the metal cation. Because the metal cation is electron poor, the ligand is electron rich. So they're kind of, you know, the cation gets attracted to that electron pair. Secondly, when we put a transition metal cation in water, usually six, you know, the general uh, number of water molecules is six water molecules coordinate around it, and which forms octahedral geometry as well. And by changing the ligand, you can change the electronic structure around the transition metal cation, and you can change the color of solution, which we'll be talking about in this lecture. So, transition metal ions, when you put them in solution, they form what are called complex ions. So again, just to recap, complex ions contain a central metal cation, which is electron poor, a covalently bonded or sometimes called a coordination bond between two or more anions or molecules. And anions or molecules are referred to as ligands. As we'll see later on, most transition metals form colored solutions, and we'll explain why. But here, for example, on the left-hand side, we have a chromium hexaamine complex. So since ammonia is neutral, this structure retains the plus three charge of chromium. And as you can see, chromium ion has six ammonia molecules around it. And so ammonia, if you remember, the nitrogen has an accessible lone pair of electrons, and that's why the nitrogen is interacting with the chromium. The chromium three plus is electron poor, the nitrogen is electron rich, you have a match. And this chromium hexaamine is a gold or orange color. When you replace one of the amines with a chloride, you see that the color changes from orange to magenta and we're going to show you explain why in just a little bit so again a metal is a has a is electron poor it's electron deficient it needs electrons the ligand has an accessible electron pair so it gets shared or coordinated to the metal and that's where you get this bond or coordination bond as they like to call it between the metal and the ligand. Now, different types of ligands can give different color solutions for the same transition metal cation. So for example, cobalt tetrachloride is a light blue solution, whereas cobalt hexa aqua is a pink solution. And then cobalt hexa amine is an orange solution. So these three all have cobalt, but the only difference is the type of ligand, which gives a different type of color solution. So now if we look at copper, copper hexa aqua, two plus is blue. Now if we replace one of those waters with a amine, like ammonia, we get a dark blue solution. Now if we remove all the waters and just do copper tetrachloride, you see it's yellow. So by changing the ligand, you change the electronic structure, which changes the color of solution. So nickel 2 plus is characteristic, characteristically green, 
Whereas if you have nickel coordinate to triphenylphosphine and thiocyanate, it changes to an orange color. So the main thing to grasp here is that the same transition metal cation, when bound to different ligands, can exhibit different types of colored solutions. Likewise, here we have cobalt 3 plus hexaamine, which is brown, and cobalt 2 plus hexaamine, which is a dark orange. So the same ligand with different cations, different charge cations, different charges of the same cation can give different color solutions. And it's all about the electronic structure and how that is altered when we have ligands. So you may ask, well, why don't other uh, elements, like main group elements, some of those cations form a colored solution. So here we're going to look at main group elements like your group 1, group 2, and group 13 elements, and of course scandium and zinc, and explain why those don't exhibit any type of colored solution. Now as you see in all of these, we have six water molecules coordinates to the metal cation. And these are all again main group cations and zinc and scandium. And we'll show you why zinc and scandium are unique in the transition metal uh, cation series. And so now if we look, for example, at magnesium 2 plus and aluminum 3 plus, we look at the orbital diagram, we see that it doesn't have any lone electrons in its outer energy orbital. So what happens is, is for transition metals that have lone electrons or empty orbitals, I should say, and lone electrons, those lone, those, or excuse me, has vacancies in the orbitals in the same energy level. As the energy passes through, it pushes an electron up. But you see in this 2p orbital, there are no vacancies available. So these electrons can't move in a favorable way and release, uh, and through absorbing energy. So since magnesium 2 plus and aluminum 3 plus have no vacancies in their orbitals and all the 2p orbitals are the same, then there's no uh, transition of electrons, aka no colored solutions. If we look at calcium 2 plus and scandium 3 plus, they have this electron configuration. And again, you see in the last orbital field, there is there are no vacancies for electrons to move. And lot, secondly, 3p orbital have all degenerate orbitals. So there's, there's not one that's higher in energy than the other. So there's no electronic transitions that can occur, so it's colorless. Or I should say there's no electronic transitions that can occur in the visible region, so it's colorless. Likewise, with zinc 2 plus, it has a completely filled S, 4S, and 3D orbital. So there's no vacancies in the last field orbital for it to for electrons to move. So therefore, there are no electronic transitions in the visible region. So with main group elements, scandium and zinc, the reason they form colorless, uh, a very basic reason why they form colorless solutions is that they have no, uh, vacant, no uh, vacancies in their orbitals or all the orbitals are degenerate, so there's no transfer of energy. Now with transition metal uh, cations, most of them form colored solutions. Depending on the charge, you get different colors. So for example, titanium is commonly three plus. It's the characteristic purple. Vanadium is commonly plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. And there is also vanadium. Yeah, never mind. And so you see each different cation of vanadium gives a different color solution. Chromium, the, the three most common, plus two, plus three, plus six, have their own characteristic color solution. Now notice here we have chromium, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper, all in water. They all give off distinct colored solutions. Now the color that it 
it appears as is not the color that absorbs. So here nickel is green. So if nickel is say, let's say it's bluish green, it's going to absorb red color. Since it absorbs red color, that's a weak interaction between the metal and ligand because red is a long wavelength, low energy. So if something absorbs red color, it has a weak interaction. Now if we look at, for example, chromium, 3 plus, which is a purple solution. The purple solution absorbs in the yellow green region. So chromium's ligand interaction is stronger than nickel because it absorbs at a lower wavelength. So again, the lower the lambda max of your compound, the stronger the interaction, the transition is, the more energy it is. So again, the complementary complement complement complementary color you see is what is what you see. The absorbed color is what it absorbs. And so again, the lower the smaller your lambda max is, the more energetic the transition is, means the larger the energy gap. The longer your lambda max is, the smaller the energy gap, the less energetic. So here we have this. Titanium 3 plus solution, it appears purple. We run a UV vis, we see that we have a lambda max around 500 nanometers, roughly. So, approximately 500 nanometers. So, there's an electronic transition that is occurring. So, it's what's happening. And this is going to blow your mind, but it's okay. Just take a deep breath. So if we write the uh, electron configuration of titanium, there's only one 3D electron. But since when you put titanium cation in solution, what happens is, is the D orbital split into EG and T2G. Again, this is energy. So again, let me, let me again state that. When you take a transition metal cation and put it in solution and ligands surround it, what happens is the D orbital split into two high energy D orbitals called EG and three low energy orbitals, D orbitals called T2G. And so what happens is as the light is passing through, some type of wavelength of light it is, is absorbed by this electron here and gets jumped to the higher level. So since it absorbs yellow green light, it transmits purple light. And that's why the solution appears purple because as the energy of the light passes through, that electron absorbs yellow green light to jump to the higher energy level. Since it's absorbing that light, only the purple light is allowed to pass through or the other colors of light that result in a purple color solution are allowed to pass through and they give it its purple color. So again, one more time, when you put a transition metal cation in solution and ligands surround it, what happens is the D orbitals split into two sets. You have a higher energy set of D orbitals called EG and you have a lower set of D orbitals called T2G. And what happens is you have electrons that transfer from the lower energy orbitals, T2G, to the higher energy orbital, EG. And since you have this transition, this electronic transition, this absorbs color in the visible region, which then causes you to have colored solutions. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into this. This is a better representation of what I just said. So again, we have, for example, copper two plus. This is its electron configuration that you learn in GenChem one. Everyone knows how to do that. 3D9, 4S1. Now, when you put it in water, you have six water molecules that surround the copper. Since you have these water molecules that surround the copper ion, this causes the energy of the orbitals to raise. And so what happens is you get a splitting 
of these d orbitals. So you have a higher energy set of d orbitals called eg, and you have a lower set of orbitals called t2g. And so what happens is as energy passes through, enough energy is absorbed by one of these electrons to pump it up to the next orbital. And then the rest is allowed to transmit. And so for copper, usually it's a like a yellow color photon gets absorbed, causing the electron to go up to the higher energy level. Now, you can only allow one electron because it only has one vacancy here. So one electron gets pumped up when it absorbs the yellow photon. Since it absorbs yellow, the opposite of yellow is blue, so it transmits a blue color. And this is why copper 2 plus in water appears blue because that one electron in the T2G orbital absorbs the yellow photon, then gets pumped up to the EG level and allows all the rest of the light to pass through, which gives you the appearance of a blue solution. So again, if we look at titanium, it's a plus three. We put it in water. These water molecules raise the energy of the d orbitals in titanium, which causes them to split. As the white light passes through, the electron in the T2G orbital absorbs yellow green photon of light and pumps up to the next energy level. And since there's only one electron, there's only one electron transition that can occur. And the rest of the light that's transmitted gives it its purple color. So since this absorbs a yellow green photon of light, means that only all the other light passes through and gives the appearance of a purple solution. So again, just to kind of reiterate, so here the lambda max of titanium three plus in water is 494 nanometers. It's a pretty strong interaction because it's a very low wavelength. Again, the lambda max can give you information about the type of energy transition that's occurring. The smaller the lambda max, the more energy, the more energetic it is, the stronger the interaction. The longer the lambda max, the lower the energy is. Now again, what happens? White light passes through the solution. This one electron here absorbs yellow green photon of light, gets pumped up, and we get this electron that jumps to a higher energy level. Now let's say, for example, we had two electrons here, then maybe a different photon of light would absorb, this electron would absorb, and it would also get pumped up. So you can't have more than one transition if you have more than one. Uh, more than one A, electron in lower level, and B, more than one accessible empty orbitals in the higher energy orbital. Now we look at color of cobalt complexes. So you put cobalt in water. You get this hexa aqua cobalt 2 plus, which is pink. Now, if you start adding, say, concentrated or very or one, two molar HCl, eventually what happens is these CLs displace the water and you get this complex ion, which is blue. So what happens is we're changing the structure around the cobalt. So we're changing its electronic structure as well. And we have different electronic transitions. So when we have cobalt in water, it's a hexa aqua cobalt, which is octahedral geometry. So this is octahedral. Now when we add enough hydrochloric acid, we get cobalt tetrachloride, which is tetrahedral. So you change, again, the structure when you change the ligand.
likewise with cobalt hexa aqua there's no real lambda max except around say 500 is the lambda max for cobalt hexa aqua uh, 2 plus but you see now when you change it from water to chloride you get a much stronger electron transition here and so you get a lambda max of about 690 700 so again you're changing the structure around the the environment around the cobalt which changes its like type of electron tra electronic transitions which causes a different absorption spectrum so remember cobalt 2 plus is 3d7 So cobalt 2 plus would look something in solution would look something like this. It's orbital diagram. And so cobalt 2 plus has the potential of two electronic transitions, depending on, you know, what type of energy passes through it can cause this electron to come up. And if you have a different wavelength, then another electron can get pumped up, but the only maximum is two electrons can be transitioned from 2T2G to EG. So here, by changing the ligand, we change its structure, which changes the type of electronic transition, which also changes the type of photon that passes through that gets absorbed, which then changes the color of the solution that it appears as. So again, cobalt hexa aqua has a lambda max, say, around 500, whereas cobalt tetrafluoride has a lambda max, you know, around six, this is probably like 680. around 680 and this is around maybe 720. So by changing the ligand, we change its electronic structure. Here again, if we look at iron, so we said earlier iron is hexa aqua plus three is like an orange, orange brown solution. Again, it's an octahedral geometry that we see here, six water molecules. Now, if we replace one of these water molecules with a thiocyanate ion, you see now just by changing one of those waters with this anion, we change the electronic structure enough that we get a different color solution. And so if we zoom in on the UV via spectra, so this one shown here is for iron three plus with six water molecules. Now, just by changing the one water molecule to thiocyanate, we go now to a different, totally different type of electron transition spectrum. And now you see lambda max is 447, whereas before, the lambda max of iron three plus was in the UV region. Remember, this is the visible region. So by changing the ligand, one of the ligands, we went from a transition in the UV region to a transition in the visible region. Now, the, the type of ligand can also affect the electronic structure. And here we're using nickel, but we're changing the type of ligand. So we have nickel, hexa aqua nickel 2 plus, has a lambda max at 720, is a bluish green solution. Next, we replace the nickel, 
the, excuse me, next we, next we replace the ligand water with ammonia. And what you notice that lambda max is 570. And now it appears as a blue solution. Then we replace the ammonia with ethylene diamine, which looks something like this. So each ethylene diamine has two nitrogens. So that's why we only need three of them. And you see that the lambda max is decreases substantially to 545 nanometers, and we get a purple solution. So what you're noticing as we change the ligands, the energy gap here increases. So energy increases. So this gap keeps getting bigger by changing the ligand. And since the energy gap is getting bigger, the wavelength decreases. So again, as energy increases, lambda decreases. So the strongest interaction between the ligand and metal is with this ethylene diamine. Again, this is called ethylene diamine. It has the strongest ligand to nickel interaction because it has the smallest lambda max. Nickel with water has the weakest interaction because it has the longest lambda max. So again, lambda max can tell you something about the, the strength of the interaction that's occurring. The smaller the lambda max, the greater the energy difference between the two energy orbit, the two d orbitals, which means a lower lambda max, more energetic transition that occurs. So you change the ligand, you change it, the energy difference between the two different types of d orbitals, e.g. and t2g, which then causes your lambda max to decrease. So when this photon, when this one of these electrons absorbs a photon at 545 nanometers, it gets pumped up to the next energy level. When one of these photons absorbs, or one of these electrons absorbs a photon at 570 nanometers, it gets pumped up. And then when one of these electrons in the nickel hexa complex absorbs, it gets pumped up as well. So again, by changing the ligand, you affect the electronic structure, meaning that the energy gap between the two different d orbitals increases, which means it takes more energy to move up to make the electron jump. Since it takes more energy, you're going to need a lower lambda max. So the lower lambda max means stronger interaction between the ligand and the metal. Just going to take a look at some more serial dilution calculations because again you'll be using serial dilution here as well. We prepared, we have a stock solution of 0.25 molar copper 2 chloride. We want to prepare 50 milliliters of a 0.15 molar solution and 0.1 molar solution. Then we want to use these, use serial dilution to prepare the 0.05 and 0.01 molar solution starting with the 0.1 molar solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the stock solution to make 50 milliliters of a 0.15 molar solution and a 0.1 molar solution and then use the 0.1 molar solution to make uh, the 0.05 and 0.01 molar solutions. So let's get started. So again to prepare the 0.15 molar solution we're going to use M1V1 equals M2V2. Of course M1 is our concentrated solution. We're looking for V1 M2 is the dilute solution, and then we're going to look, we want 50 milliliters of the dilute solution. So when you work this out, you see that we need 30 milliliters of the 0.25 molar solution, and then the rest, aka 20 milliliters, is water. For the 0.1 solution, again, we set it up the same way. Our solution, our volume of dilute solution is 50 milliliters. 
we see that we need 20 milliliters of the 0.25 molar solution and the rest is water, the 30 milliliters. Now to prepare the 0.05 molar solution, here we're gonna use M1 of 0.1 because we're gonna make it from the 0.1 molar solution. We wanna know how much it is. We wanna make a 0.05 molar solution and we want 50 milliliters. So we see that we need 25 milliliters of this 0.1 molar solution and then the rest is water to make 0.05. Again, we use serial dilution so that we don't need such a small volume of solution to make a dilute solution. And then lastly, to prepare the 0.01 molar solution, from the 0.1 molar solution, we set it up, we see that we need, oh, that's wrong. This should be five milliliters here. We need five milliliters of the 0.1 molar solution and the rest, the 45 milliliters is water. And so this is the calculation that you would use to A, either find out how much of the concentrated solution you need, or B, by adding a certain volume of the concentrated solution to make, say, 50 milliliters of dilute solution, you can calculate the dilute solution's concentration. So again, we'll be using Beer's Law Plot or Beer's Law for this lab in your post-lab assignment. You will be given data. You will need to plot absorbance on the y-axis, concentration on the x-axis, plot your data points. In one of the questions, you'll have to actually produce the data from the virtual lab. Then you'll do your linear regression and post your equation R squared on the graph. And then you'll be asked questions about the linear regression analysis. Now remember that the slope equals epsilon B. So B is the path length, epsilon is the molar absorptivity. And so if you know the path length B, then you can solve for the molar absorptivity. So molar absorptivity equals M divided by B. And so if your path length is given to you and you know the slope, you can determine the molar absorptivity. Now, make sure you watch over the lab lecture notes and this lab lecture video. Read over the background information for the spectrophotometric analysis of copper. Take the lab lecture quiz. Note that you will need Excel for the lab lecture quiz. One question on the lab lecture quiz uses Excel. So make sure you have Excel open and ready to go so you can do the, the one question that requires you to plot data. After that, complete the virtual lab on the Hayden McNeil site and the questions on that site. And then finally, complete the post lab assignment for the spectrophotometric analysis of copper. Now all of these assignments are due by 11 p.m. on Monday. I won't write that because but check the due dates. You'll see that the due date has changed for this. Oh, no, it has. Just scratch that. Just, yeah, make sure you check the due dates for when these assignments are due because we're getting near the end of the semester. We don't want you to forget uh, assignments. So on that note, that concludes the last lab lecture for this General Chemistry 1 lab series. I hope you've enjoyed sharing your time with me. Uh, each time you watch one of these sessions, I hope it was informative and you learned something from it. Uh, if you did like the video, you learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. But on that note, Dr. Armand signing off and good luck on your final exam. <laughs>